can look at it in much more detail later on on your own. But basically what I want to cover is a few, a little bit of history about web servers and web applications and all the different architectures that have been put in place uh, pretty much since 1985 or 1986 till today. Um, so let's start with the most important guy that is actually allow us to create a website, which is the web server. <coughs> what is a web server? A web server is a service that runs on a computer somewhere, right? And all it does, all, all it's designed for is to serve files. That's all it does. Okay? Static content. And this is going back to 1985 to probably uh, mid 90s, okay? Beginning of the 90s, where most of the websites they were just static HTML content, pictures, and that's it. Maybe an advertisement about the university, maybe um, you know advertisement about services. Nothing dynamic no pictures moving, flashing, or anything like that. Just a nice picture with a description of what was the website about. They're all static. And every time you hit that URL, the website, all, that, all it did was serve those files, serve the static content. So to generate dynamic content and allow users to interact, we needed to execute code on the machine running the web server. Okay, so initially most of those websites, since they were static, they weren't even asking for any information from the user. Okay, as soon as the need, there was a need to ask for information from the user, then that's when they started to create the code that will capture that in input on the server, and the first conventional approach back in the mid beginning of the 90s was called the Common Gateway Interface, CGI for short. And it was basically a C program, an executable that will run. It will, it, you will hit the server with that executable and the server will say, oh, you mean you want me to run this um, application, CGI application. The CGI applications will allow users to hook many types of executable programs within the, within the web server. So there will be like an executable, and we're going to see an example. I'm going to show you guys an example. There will, see, there will be like an executable that allow me to list all my transactions. And then another executable that will allow me to uh, take a look at just the deposits. And there will be another executable that would allow me to do to just view the balances and stuff like that. You know, it was it was there was an executable for every single functional requirement of the website. The language used should, uh, usually was C plus C C plus plus. There was some Perl. Um, it should have CGI libraries to interact with the web server. So you had to make sure that you you had those libraries or hookups from the web server that would allow you to communicate with your application, either in C, in Perl, PHP, Python, JavaScript, Visual Basic, etc., etc. Now, CGI creates a new process for every HTTP request. So, if there were 10 users hitting the web server, each one of the users, as soon as they hit that executable, will have its own process in this machine running the web server. As you can see, this thing did not scale very well. We're talking about beginning of the 90s. The servers didn't have that much memory. And every time that somebody hit it, <laughs> there was a new process created. That means Spacing memory was reserved for that person, and all that stuff that involves creating a new process. 
If the program is relatively short, starting the process can dominate the execution time. So pretty much most of the time was spent in 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 creating the process so it will run and then shifting the process back and forth between memory and and this space to uh, fulfill the next request. Okay? So if a program is called n times, that program is loaded into memory n times. So you can see what the problem is with CGI. And then when Java came about, um, Java started back in 1995. The Enterprise Edition, which is what Servlets uh, is part of, probably didn't start till 90, 98, 99. And Java came with the idea of servlets. And servlets, actually, it's 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 not really a framework. It's it's more, it's like a library that it's part of the Enterprise Edition, or what it, today it's called the Java Enterprise Edition. Okay. And the beauty of Java servers was that it, it, it allowed programmers to inherit from the serverlet class, which was one of the classes that was given to you as part of the library. And servlets were inherently multi-threading. What does that mean? It means that it doesn't need a process for every request. One process can spawn several threads, and they can execute it at the same time if you had the power, the hardware power to do it. But they didn't. They, they would share the same space in memory on the machine that it was running. This will make um, the whole web server or web application running under this concept much faster and more scalable. The Java virtual machine will stay running and handle each HTTP request as a thread, not as a separate process, but as a thread of the same process. Okay, so you know that the threads will have like a common area where they will share information, and they will have their like their own little uh, subspace. Threads are lightweight compared to heavyweight operating system processes. So let let, let us compare the servlets with the CGI. <coughs> servlets, for instance, there was automatic parsing and decoding of HTML form data. In CGI, you had to parse your own input, okay, making sure that there was no injection of of execution of of, of some Linux commands or whatever. There's also parsing of HTTP headers and cookies. There's there's the ability to track sessions either through cookies or embedded session ID in, in Java servlets, not in CGI. Uh, at least not inherently. You will have to develop it yourself. And the fact that, well, maybe not so much in the mid-90s, but the fact that everybody was familiar with the Java programming language and made things easier. Maybe in the mid-90s there were more people more familiar with C than with Java, but today that's one of the advantages of servlets. Multiple servlets can share data, making it easy for resource sharing optimization. So if you think about a servlet serving one functional requirement of the user, each servlet, they can have like a shared space where they can communicate with each other and they can save and and retrieve data, okay? <coughs> because they're part of the same process. And they can maintain information from request to request, which was something that it could not be done with the CGI. Also, the portability. As we all know, Java programming language is supported across many different platforms. So you didn't have to be on a specific architecture or a specific operating system. Okay, And they are supported directly on or by a plugin on virtually every major web server. In fact, you know, these servers right here serve approximately 60, if not 70% of all the websites in the world. 
so Apache Westphere, which is based on Apache. Um, uh, what else? Uh, JBoss, uh, WebLogic, all those are based on the Apache uh, web server. And also the other um, competitor, second to Apache, which is IIS from Microsoft. Okay. Security, for instance. The main vulnerability of CGI was security. Programs are often executed by general purpose operating system shells, which means they are they're prone to for for shell injection of, of commands and stuff like that. CGI programmers must be careful to filter out characters such as backward semicolons that are treated specially by the shells. And some languages used with CGI do not automatically check arrays or string bounds. For instance, in C it's perfectly legal to allocate a 100 element array and then try to write something on the 999th element. Okay? And many of those buffer overflows created securities on the web server. So such weaknesses are constantly being uncovered in widely used CGI libraries. <coughs> Another uh, reason why serverless was better than CGI it was it was an ex it was not expensive and it was it was inexpensive. There are a number of free and very good web servers that are good for development out there. And you can start with free or inexpensive server and later on upgrade to the licensed ones, which are a little bit more expensive. Um, we already know this this the web server will look something like this. Tomcat Actually, when you when you install Apache Tomcat, you're installing both the Apache server and the Tomcat, the Tomcat uh, server container, okay, all in one, and we call it the web server. And uh, when you install that, it gives you the ability as a end user to request via HTTP, and also um, hook up to several databases, okay. So now let's take a look at some of the uh, architectures initially used in web application. The, the two-tier and three-tier architectures, um, and what do they really mean? Because sometimes what it might look like it's a three-tier, it's not really a three-tier, it's, it's in reality a two-tier architecture. So I'm going to try to clarify those concepts. Um, you got to be uh you got to differentiate between the hardware which is the physical implementation of the architecture versus the software which is the logical implementation of the of the of the architecture and we're going to go through both of them um two tier architecture refers to a client server architecture and I'm sure you guys have heard of that that was typically the development in the mid 90s up until almost the year 2000, where there was a piece of software installed on a computer, on a desktop computer, and there was another piece of software that was installed on the server. And they communicate with each other. One was the client, another one was the server. And there was code on both sides. Okay? There was running code on both sides. Typically the database was stored in the server, right? And typically the server didn't have any interface. While on the client, the client was a lot of interface and a little bit of code. And then a newer client-server architecture came about called the three-tier architecture, which introduces a middle tier of the application logic. Okay. So this is what a two-tier hardware architecture will look like. This is the client, and this is the server. Okay. Simple as that. What do you think about the three-tier hardware architecture? On the three-tier, you had the same client, but then the server is broken into two. 
it's broken into the application server which is specific to the business needs and a database server which is specific to persist data okay this is typically a three-tier hardware architecture. So in here, and you, under user interface, you will have a desktop, literally, on a LAN, communicating with an application server, a server that had some kind of program feeding requests. And then that application server, through the same LAN, will communicate with another piece of equipment another piece of hardware that was running just the database. Okay. So on a two-tier software, now let's talk about the software. We just finished talking about the hardware. What about the software? What is a two-tier software architecture? In a two-tier, you had the desktop that was running the client application, and you had literally a database server. And all you did was you had all pretty much 90% or more of the logic on the client, and it will just use the, ser to the database server to see to save and retrieve data. And and most of the most of the business logic was put on the database server. That's why the database was typically called the application. Okay, so all the intelligence of the application was actually on the ser on the database server. That's typical of a two-tier software um, architecture. And it will look something like this, you know? So you had objects on the client that will do queries on the database. And the database, typically more than tables and data, it was filled with with triggers and and compiled queries that will run fast. And these queries will be will be built on, on PL SQL, which is uh um, it's a programming language, actually. It's a structured language, PL SQL, um, that will handle most of the most of the application intelligence, all on the database. Okay. So, what do you think about two-tier architecture? One will say, why not? It's very simple to create, right? You just create a user interface, you make sure that you install it on as many clients as you want, and then you have a database server that it's feeding them all. What's wrong with that? Something very simple. Well, as more and more applications were developed this way, they noticed that 2 tier architectures show striking weaknesses that make the development and maintenance of such applications more expensive. So modifying the application implied a lot of work. Not only modifying it, but testing it and deploying it to all these different machines. Okay. What else? Data is only accessible to the public through the dynamic pages on the web server. It raises data security questions. Also, applications cannot be easily converted to different client types. If you wanted to include a different client type, it was like it was like doing the whole application all over again. Okay? So, that's when most of the architects, developer act, uh, architects out there decided, you know what, we should try to decouple the business logic, the actual logic that create the application from either the persistent layer or the user interface layer. And that's when they introduce a three-tier software architecture. And this is what it will look like. You will have the user in first layer. You will have the persistent layer all the way on the end. And then in the middle, you will have what is called the domain layer, or the business layer. Okay? 
And as things started to get more and more complicated, more, um, I would say, um, more broken up into their own responsibilities without stepping on each other's toes, then they created the fourth tier software architecture. And this is what it will look like. And this is typically uh, typical of modern web-based applications today. In fact, the application that you guys are going to be building is going to be a four-tier software architecture type. Okay, And this is what it will look like. The user interface layer doesn't have to be a web server. It could be a web server, but it doesn't have to be a web server. It can be a... a a mobile application, it could be a web service, it could be, you know, JSON, XML, who cares? The user interface layer can change. And why can it change so easily? Well, because there's a second tier called the servlet tier, okay? that all it does is manipulates the requests that's all it does that's what that's the the specialization of the servlet uh, layer which knows how to communicate with the domain layer and the domain layer is the application is the meat of the application is it's where the business rules are it's where the entities that represent your systems live and then at, at the end the fourth layer which is the the usual, the persistence layer, which typically it's a, it's a database. doesn't have to be, but it typically is a relation to database. Um, I have an example for you guys of a healthcare system, which I'm going to be uploading into Moodle. So you guys have... Um, it's basically a very small project that you can import into Eclipse, that you can run, and it will show you the four tiers. So you will have the conventional user interface layer, which are JSPs, typically. Okay. Then you have the servlet layer, which is the the ones that actually know how to um, answer to the to the requests on the client side. Okay, and then there's the business logic layer, and then the the layer that persists data into the database. So on the user interface, we get something like get patient record. Get patient record is a JSP, and there's another one called the post patient record. So you can either post a new patient or get p existing patient information. Okay, and they will both be handled by the same servlet. It's called a patient record servlet. So this servlet knows how to do stuff with patients, like posting and getting them. Okay? And it will make use of the patient record, which is one of the business. Actually, I wouldn't call it even patient record. I would have called it just patient. Patient is an entity in a healthcare system obviously. I mean, you can identify, right? You can identify that, right? That a patient is a very meaningful, important p entity in a healthcare system. And then, finally, on the data access layer, you do have, the, you have the patient record database. I would have called it the patient manager, or the patient persistent manager, whatever. They call it the patient rec record DB. Remember, these are all Java classes that you can name this however you want them. So what are the advantages of 3-tier or 4-tier architecture? There's a clear separation of user interface and data presentation from the application logic. So in other words, you could change the way you do business, and your interface or your persistent layer will not be affected. Key. That's key. Data protection and security is simpler to obtain because you have to put the security on just those spots that are risky. 
like critical business processes that work with security sensitive data are hidden from the client. With small changes to the presentation layer, applications can be easily used by other types of clients. Okay. Redefinition of the storage strategy won't even influence the clients. In other words, if you decide to put your your persistent layer on, a, on an Oracle database, and then two years from now you decide to put it on on an object-oriented relation um, on an object orient no, no, what is it an object uh, database management system, which is different than the relationship. Doesn't really matter. You can do that. You don't. It, the clients will not be affected by it because you have pretty much decoupled all the different parts from each other. The client still access the data over a stable and well-designed interface, which encapsulates all the storage details. And you guys can take a look at the healthcare system. The healthcare system. This is the domain layer. This is the, these are the servlets. I mean, this is dissecting the the actual. Um, this is dissecting the actual um, um, uh, domain model of the system into its different uh, layers. The browser. Uh, you can see the persistent layer in here. That's the healthcare system. Uh, new patient. You know, there's a there's a, a diagram of um, the the relationship between uh, an activity diagram on how the new patient is created, for instance. You know, and how do you search for patients? And there's also an activity diagram for that. So finally, after building so many four tier architecture web applications, somebody said, wait a minute, most of these applications have like a, a pattern to it. And in fact, Martin Fowler, which is one of the um, creators of, of this pattern, uh, noticed this and he said, you know what, this this is a very special pattern, and, and he called it the MVC architecture pa pattern. Because he noticed that most of these applications had components or, 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 or layers, and he named them the model, the view, and the controller layers. <coughs> and originally, this concept was built into the Smalltalk language. Anybody heard of the Smalltalk language? This is this is a language back in 1985, 86. Okay, it's a very. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if this Smalltalk is from the 70s. Very old um, programming language, very similar to C. But the difference was that small talk had the model view controller pattern as part of its of its language. So the small talk had specific classes to implement the design pattern. And it was intended now this is back in the eighties, okay? So forget about the website. There weren't any real web applications back then. So the intention was for desktop applications where Windows could be used and refreshed with new information and control could be delegated and maintained. So it wasn't even thought of as a web application. And the idea was to separate the UI into three parts. What application does logically, how it displays it, and how it handles the input from the user. So literally, when you build a small talk application, you will be building three thi different things. What the application does logically, separately, how it displays that information separately, and how it handles the input from the user separately. Okay. So what was the model? 
The model is the one that calculates, that sorts, that stores, that retrieves. It's any object in the model. It implements application functionality. It holds data relevant to the application. You guys pretty much understand what the whole concept of the model is. What about the view? The view is the one that uses and depends on the information on the model, right? Or from the model. It provides a visual interpretation of what you're trying to convey with the, with the application. It must be notified or updated for any changes, right? And has one associated model and one associated controller. This is very important to understand. The view has one associated model and one associated controller. What about the controllers? The controllers are the ones that accept the input from the user, right? And it knows what to do with it. It knows how to delegate it to some model. It processes the current user. It also validates, which is a very important concept that we're going to see with Spring. Spring gives you the ability to be able to, to um, in a separate class, in a, in a separate concern, be able to validate data that has been input. The controller also listens to the keyboard. Well, back then it was listening to the keyboard because it was a client-server application, but, I mean, today, obviously, it's going to listen to the browser more than keyboard. I'm sorry? No, it's not on the controller. It's not on the controller. And ask each view and window whether they want to control or not. I shouldn't say it's done. In the it's it's done as interceptors of the controller. So before it reaches the the uh, the controller, it has to intercept it. Yeah. Because remember, all the controller is doing is delegating. So before it delegates it, you have to make sure that that's the right data, the right input. And this is what a picture will look like, right? This is the view. It has a model and a controller associated to it. This is the controller. It has a model and a view associated to it. And then the model which has <coughs> all these as dependents. So in a similar fashion, we're gonna done. We're gonna be done now. In a similar fashion, that's how it implements the they decided to implement the MVC architecture for the web. <coughs> now, traditional MVC implementation is not possible on the web. Can you tell me why? What is different about the web versus a client server? The traditional MVC implementation was not possible on the web. Remember what I said, for instance, the controller listens to the keyboard? <laughs> you think the controller on a server is listening to what you type on the keyboard? No. In fact, the controller doesn't know anything about what you're typing until uh, you say, hey, send it. Send this request. Now, under today's technology, we can do that with JavaScript. And this is the beauty about JavaScript. JavaScript is code that runs on the browser. And it's capable of sending requests live, quick, to the server. What is that concept? Anybody knows what that concept is called? AJAX. Thank you. Asynchronous JavaScript and XML. AJAX. So through AJAX you can simulate that the controller is listening to your keyboard. Okay. But why is it not tra the traditional MVC implementation not possible on the web? Well first thing because updating and notifying the view every time the model changes. Can do that updating and notifying the view every time the model changes. Eh, with Ajax today, uh, yeah, it's possible. But back then, when they decided to implement the MVC architecture into the web, it was not possible. 
<coughs> possible solution is to refresh the JSP in times intervals to check for new information. That's not true. You guys have used AJAX type of applications today, right? If you have login into live.com or Hotmail or Google Mail or whatever, any one of those, you know that that's a web application that is using AJAX. And it doesn't have to refresh the whole page in order to change the view every time the model changes. Still not to the specification of traditional MVC because it's not the job of the view to check. True, but the model's job to notify the view. Well, yeah, that's what asynchronous means. Asynchronous means, hey, the view uh, is going to do the request and it will get notified by the model when it's done. You know, there's a sort of like a little delay in there but it's possible. <coughs> All right, so that's enough for <coughs> All right, so let's go back to Eclipse. And Let me see if I can import. Or you know what? Let's let's just <coughs> let's just create a brand new project. We're gonna create a brand new project. And we're gonna call it uh, it's gonna be a dynamic web project. And we're gonna call it the health sys it's going to be an apache tomcat 2.5 all that stuff you know i'm going to leave everything just default health sys okay and then Somewhere in here, I have the source code, and I'm going to be doing piece by piece, so we don't do it all at the same time. Let's take a look. Um, take a look at for a second at the um, PowerPoint presentation and let's, t let's take a look at the at the architecture of the application for a second here it is this is the healthcare system sample so let's do how about if we do this let's do the database piece first Okay. In fact, this is the other thing that is due for next week. You guys have to create your database. At this point, you guys already know who are your main entities. You should know what are the characteristics, i.e. attributes of those entities. So I think you are in a good position to be able to create at least the first draft of your database. Okay, so that's what's new for that's what's due for next week. Plus the domain model. Remember the domain model is going to be a picture of all your entities and their relationships. So let's create the health system database. As you guys know, all the JSPs will go into the web inf folder, right, under the web content. So we're going to paste it in here. And here it is. This is the health system. So the JSP says healthcare system example, 
healthcare example with default values. Oh, get PR. Get PR is the healthcare example with default values. So, and then there's a test database, and then there's a search patient records. All right. So let's see if this one runs. I'm just going to make sure that this thing is running. And in fact, this is what you should do every time that you develop. Just just add a little bit of code and test it. Don't wait until it's two days of code and then it's going to be so scary trying to test this thing because you're going to start getting all kinds of errors. So I'm going to move it to the web content. All right. Let's make sure that we clean up the project. Okay, and then we're going to run it on the server. All right, this is what it looks like. It's a very simple application, right? So we have the healthcare system example. This one is going to go to get patient record, this link. And if you guys remember, the get patient record is the one that goes into the database and grabs. Are we ready for that? No, we're not. We haven't even created the database yet. This one is going to go into the get PR. And get PR is nowhere in here. It's not specified. Get PR is the health example with default values. I think the get PR, what, it, what it's going to do is going to actually create the database and put data out there. Now, I've got to make sure that I have my database running. I don't even know. Yeah, here it is. Here's my SQL database running, as you guys can see. So I'm ready. Um, so let's bring over to the project get PR. And we're going to put it on the web content. And get PR, if we look at it, eh, get PR is just asking for last name, address, CD, and stuff like that, as you guys can see. And is there a form? Yeah, the form is going to a patient record servlet. Aha! Uh -huh. So that's the one that is going to actually save the uh, patient information. So get PR will only ask for me for it. Now let how about get test database? Let's take let's check out get test data, get test database. Copy and paste it in here. Nope. This one is talking about a patient record, which I don't have. That's class. And if there's an error message, then I'm just going to create the database. PR create the database. Oh, so patient record probably knows how to create the database. Okay, as you guys can see, PR is the patient record. So I have to add those things into my project. Healthcare system. So here we have. There's a uh, patient, here it is, patient record and patient record view. So as you guys can see, we're going to have to create a COM healthcare system patient package. So let's build that. Where's the source? Java sources, here they are. So we're going to create a new package. And the package is going to be COM health care system what was it com health care system patient okay and inside that package i'm going to put these two guys the patient record and the patient record view and we're going to see what they look like 
patient record looks like any time now like this okay so somehow I'm missing the healthcare storage and the healthcare exception that's fine we'll we'll add them later but this is what a patient record looks like look at this social security number first name blah 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 all that stuff there's a constructor which initializes everything to uh, blanks and there's another one in which you pass every single field value and then these are the getters and setters so every single property has a getter and a setter and I hope you guys already understand what that means and then look at this there's a save so the patient record knows how to save itself into a database and the search records search records knows how to search create test database here it is what do you know this is pretty cool you guys see what it's doing in a for loop counting from 0 to 999 it's actually creating random social securities and zip codes and phone numbers <laughs> and it's creating everybody with last name last name from city city Florida and they're all females well actually if it's S less than five then it's a male okay <laughs> so it's actually generating 1,000 patients on the fly okay and then there's a test object a patient rec a test object I don't know what that means oh and then there's a test all right so we're gonna have to run this but before we run it we're gonna have to Where is save? I didn't see save anywhere. Did you guys see save? Oh yeah, save. This is the one that this is the one that actually saves into the database. Now save uses patient record DB. And patient record DB, if you guys remember from our architecture, patient record DB is the actual Java class that persists the data into the database. So right now we're looking at patient record, the business logic, right? That's the one that knows how to search, how to save, and all that stuff from the business perspective. Now let's take a look at the patient record DB. That's the one, that's actually the man, what we call the manager of the, um, of the model. And it's probably here under storage. Here it is. So we're going to have to create another package called the COM Healthcare System Storage. Let's do that. Let's create a new package called the COM Healthcare System Storage. And inside that package, we're going to put the DB handler and the patient record DB and we're going to see what those guys do the patient record DB extends from a DB handler and we're going to see what that means later on but basically let me see if we can clean this project okay basically the patient record DB has methods like save a record and you just pass the patient information or build a query and you just pass a patient or get the patient record and you just pass a patient okay he knows how to do all that stuff look at this it's actually creating the query select star from patient where I don't know maybe the social security uh, is like or starts with whatever 
or where the city is, whatever, or the last name, or you know, it's capable of building a query so that you can search for records. And this is all done in Java. Okay? And it also has a get patient records. But this one, it accepts a string, a query. Okay? Which is different from this one, get patient record. Get patient record, you're actually passing a record, uh, a patient entity. For get patient records, you're passing the actual query string. And what does it do? It actually, this is the guy that actually, this is where they, the rubber hits the road, as we say. Okay? Because this, this is the one that actually creates the query, or the query is already created, the, 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 that, that sends the query to the database and returns back the results. And what is it going to do with it? It's going to create an array for each record that it that that it finds. It's going to create a new patient and it's going to populate it for it, it each one of the fields. Look at this, guys. This is what you have to do when you do not use an ORM. What is an ORM? Object Relational Mapper. Object Relational Mapper. You only have to talk to it as in objects, and it will return back objects. With this example, you have to create the objects yourself. So you have to create every single new patient. You have to populate it out of the result set, every single field, and then you add it to the users. And users is a vector. You know, vector is like the threat safe list in Java. So wow. This is doing a lot of stuff. But that's what it is for. Patient record DB. Patient record DB is the guy that actually saves and retrieves data from the database. Okay? Um, tell you what, guys. Let's take a break. Ten minute break. And then we'll continue with the health patient. And then what I'm going to do after that is I'm going to um, show you guys how you can create your database and because it's not only the database you guys have to create your entities in in your project so that's the first thing that you have to do create the database and as soon as you create the database you have to create your entities the entities are what in Java, they're pojos, plain old Java objects. They're also called beans, right? It's pretty much a class that has attributes, getters and setters for every attribute. And these attributes most probably are going to be a one-to-one -to, -one to the fields in the database that you create. Fields in the tables of the database that you create, I should say. Okay?